and welcome back to Netball Nation for the second part of Series 2. I am joined, as always, by the dynamic duo. I think that's the first time I've called you that. Slara <laughs> and Max. So which one's Batman and which one's Robin? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm in black, so I'm taking Batman. <laughs> All right, then. I'll bob along, then. I'll be bobbing. <laughs> uh, Sara, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Yeah, I went to Italy last week to see Karen Atkinson in her beautiful home. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, a lot of pizza and pasta and prosecco and, oh. and swimming sunshine. pools and beach and sunshine and, yeah, all the Mag- bad stuff in life, you know. Mags, it sounds like we have a much better time here in Yorkshire, doesn't it? Oh. <laughs> Without question. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of your holidays, Sarah. What do you think, Mags? Um, it's, well, certainly not in, in Italy. Um, just the just everyday stuff that you do, that you're able to do, you know, garden, you know, um, going to the supermarket. We're still in that so-called lockdown, aren't we? Where Sometimes when you class going to the supermarket is an activity, isn't it? Do you know what, Sarah? I get myself ready for it. It's like, going, it's like having a it's night exciting. out. It's exciting. It is yeah. exciting. Shower, face <laughs> on, what am I going to wear? <laughs> the whole lot. Um, now, Max, you've celebrated a birthday since we last recorded a podcast. Indeed. How was about your birthday? Was it lovely? Oh, it was just absolutely amazing. I had the best day for, for, for years, and I don't, I don't know why, but um, took the puppy for a big, long walk um, with my daughter, and then, you know, sort of saw friends from the outside because, you know, you're not allowed to mingle and things yeah. thrown at your doorstep, you know, thinking, is it a bomb or is it a present? <laughs> <laughs> I hope the latter. You, you're still with us. So. I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> so it's surreal, but a really lovely day. Thank you. Nice. I'm glad. Well, it sounds like you've both had a lovely time. And uh, sorry, you've come back with a fairly decent tan and some lovely hair that I'm very jealous of. So. Yeah, this is what the sunshine does. So it'll be gone by next week. You are absolutely rocking it. Now then, before we get into today's show, we need to tell you about another amazing competition this August, powered by Netball UK and supported by ASICS. We're giving you the chance to win a pair of ASICS brand new netball trainers for you and a pair for a friend. We've got eight pairs to give away of four shoes available now at Netball UK. The ASICS Professional FF2, Super FF, Academy 8 and Professional 2GS Junior. Every week in August, we'll be featuring one of those shoes on the podcast and telling you why you need a pair. This week, it's the ASICS Super FF Netball Shoe, which has been released in three stunning new colours. Peacoat, Vapor and Diva Pink, which you so happen to be wearing today, Mags. You're wearing the Diva Pink now, aren't you? I am. And that is also exclusive to Netball UK. So now we've crucially established it looks great. Even more importantly, this top of the range trainer shouts technology. The Super FF has everything you need to support you while playing netball and is the only ASICS netball shoe to feature all nine of the top technologies. If you want stability, this is the shoe for you. Just ask England and Manchester Thunder Vice Captain Laura Malcolm. She swears by them and is now wearing the Diva Pink. Order yours at netballuk.co.uk. Or to win some, go to the My Netball Nation website and click on the banner on the homepage and you'll be back to court ready with Netball UK and ASICS. Now then, into today's show, guys. How will women's sport recover from the coronavirus? Will female athletes have to give up the sport? We'll have a chat about how netball can bounce back from a bad summer to the momentum it reached last year. Now then, but before we get to all of that, we have our analyst at Nine Netball with us here on Netball Nation, Michael Hutchinson. (laughs) Hi. Thank you so much for joining us um, from Australia as well. What time is it there? Uh, it's quarter past ten at night. We appreciate this, Michael. We do appreciate this. That's all right. There's the two uh, Suncorp Super Netball games have just finished, so I would have been up anyway. <laughs> well, don't tell us the results. No, I won't. I won't. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, how are you, Michael? We ask everyone that we have on uh, a Netball Nation how they are, but particularly during the pandemic, what is the feeling like over there at the minute? Um, well, I guess the area, I'm about half an hour east of the CBD in Victoria, um, outside of, outskirts of um, Melbourne, really. But we're, the whole state's in uh, a stage four lockdown at the minute, which means uh, we can't leave our houses after eight o'clock at night. We can't travel any further than five kilometres from home. We're only allowed outside home for an hour walk per day and masks are mandatory. 
Um, and we've pretty much been in lockdown apart from a couple of weeks since late March. So it's a little bit tedious now that we're at, um, you know, the middle of August. But, um, you know, as long as, you know, we're, we're safe and we're healthy, I think that's the main thing. And how are you coping with it? Obviously, you say it's tedious, but psychologically, I mean, it's almost like being in a home prison, isn't it? You know, having a curfew and having to come back. Yeah, it is. And I guess I'm thankful I've got a bit of backyard and a front yard and a netball ring and all that sort of stuff to be able to get outside. What and, more do you um, need? <laughs> yeah, what more do you need? And our Suncorp Super Netball's back and started, so it's got a little bit to keep us occupied. Absolutely. And for anyone listening, Michael, can you just tell us a, a little bit about your role and what it involves? Um, so basically, when games are in Melbourne or when I'm you know, allowed to travel around the country with um, Channel 9, who's the broadcaster for Suncorp Super Netball, um, it basically means that all of the, the data that's collated by Champion Data, which is a consortium that collate all of the raw data that happens in a Super Netball game, um, I try and sift through that and come up with anything that's interesting or intriguing or assists to tell the story about what's happening on court and feed that through to commentary. Um, and then there's also a bit of analysis um, post-round and, and pre-round to um, sort of give a little bit of a historical um, look at what's happening about the matches that are coming up as well. So basically, you've got to have good concentration levels and a lot of patience with what you do, haven't you? Yeah, basically. I know how to work a spreadsheet. That's about it. I would be absolutely terrible. There's a reason you <laughs> did that job and we did this one. Um, I mean, you mentioned it there, obviously, Super Netball, it is back. What have you made um, of the action so far? Have you got any best games, Michael? Um, probably the game on the weekend, the Lightning and Magpies, was probably the, the match of the season so far for mine. Um, I think the fact that there was no Super goals scored by the Lightning as well probably um, adds another layer to the conversation about the introduction of that rule this year. But to be honest, it didn't matter to me whether we are going into a, a World Cup style um, competition this year or whether we were going to be able to get 14 weeks of competition. The fact that we've got netball back in this country, I think is huge, not just for um, women and girls um, in the country, but for everyone around the world as well. We know you guys have obviously, unfortunately, missed out with your Super League this season. So the fact that you have something to grasp onto, I think is um, really important. Yeah, it certainly is. It's, it's allowed us to still carry on talking about it, basically. Um, <laughs> and the Super Shot, we've asked that we, well, we've had very strong opinions on the Super Shot. Um, I'm casting my eyes over to Sara and Mags right now because <laughs> we already know their opinions. Um, what, is, what is your take on it? What do you make of it? I hate it with every fibre of my being. Yes, oh, um, he's now within the, in the circle of trust now. <laughs> I'm, not saying circle. That, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that because, you know, I listen to your podcast and I know where you guys stand, but for me it's a definitive tear in the traditional fabric of our game. Um, the fact that the Super Netball Commission brought it in because they felt that there was a lack of long shots in the game and that was somehow one of the most intriguing and interesting parts of, of Super Netball um, sort of bemused me. Um, so the fact that it's in and over the first two rounds, we haven't really seen any differentials apart from um, a drop in accuracy from, from that range um, compared to last year. So for mine, it's, it's completely irrelevant. It's a bit gimmicky and um, I could do without it, to be honest. Do you, do you think it's a little bit disrespectful to the game in terms of, you know, the broadcasters and Suncorp basically coming in saying, you know, this game isn't, isn't exciting enough it's not giving us enough for audiences you know we want to we we do want a gimmick we want something more from it um i think the issue that's been highlighted and i know that's been spoken about by super netball chair marina go is that they don't have the money to market the game that in the way which they would like to um but for me that there there are many stakeholders that need to to take that burden and that responsibility on and do something about it and not simply look at the game and go, well, we can agitate the waters in terms of the media. We can get up or out of the, um, the fans and the spectators, um, try and get some new eyes and also, you know, um, put the athletes and the, and the clubs on the back foot, you know, a couple of, um, what was it, days or weeks out from the competition starting um, as a means to try and generate conversation. I mean, from that initial um, post on social media. I think they got eight or nine good days of of media coverage out of it, but then it still went quiet in the lead up to the um, to the competition. But and so for mine, it's a lack of um, investment in products that are external to broadcast. So we don't have a radio show that covers the game. We don't have um, 
you know, an official nine netball or a super netball podcast. We don't have um, a TV show that's got super netball on it. We don't have enough netballers in, in the media space or in the sporting space that would help um, probably get some, some legs and allow netball to be talking about 12 months of the year. So on the back of that, the commission have really um, pulled the trigger to, to put this super netball shot um, into play. For mine, it's a matter of whether this is a last resort and this is and this is it and this is the mm. last roll of the dice or whether this is the beginning of the end and what the product's going to look like in a couple of years' time is going to be so different from grassroots that it's going to be unrecognisable. Mm. Do you think, like, the Constellation Cup happens after Suncorp's finished? Uh, do you think it'll have an impact on... Well, I guess mostly the Diamonds, the... the the Silver Ferns only really have Lower Langman playing, don't they, in that league? Do, do you think it'll impact the Australian team? Yeah, I do. I think we've already seen that the timeouts have had a negative impact for the Diamonds, and I think you can sort of track that through some of their performances, particularly in the second half across the World Cup. So to add another layer on top of that, and the rolling subs as well, we're actually not developing 60-minute athletes who are consistent um, for long periods of time. Um, and I know that that is a concession on the back of a condensed season and having an extended bench as well. But um, yeah, I, I guess we're not going to know the full extent of, of how it's going to affect the diamond until we see them in action. Um, and whether there are adjustments around, you know, what happens next year apart from the super shot, because I think that will be back next year, um, you know, remains to be seen. We can only hope that, um, you know, the diamonds sort of come out of it as unscathed as possible, really. Mm -hmm. I'm just going back to something you said, uh, Michael, when you were answering the previous question about the lack of, um, you know, thorough coverage uh, all year round within netball. Um, and as someone who works in that field, particularly now we've had, you know, the impact of COVID-19, how do you see netball looking in terms of the coverage and any momentum building? Can you see that happening in the future? I think that they've already done a study and identified that there is um, a large um, portion of females who will not go back to playing sport on the back of COVID-19. So you've got to sort of had, have an eye on the elite product and also an eye on your participation because that's essentially what's going to funnel through to your elite product in five, ten years' time. So you've got to have both eyes on the ball in, in that sort of sense. Um, but the fact that we haven't had ANL this year as well means that we don't know if there's going to be any new athletes or retirements this year um, to go into the next season. And the fact that the contracting period is essentially already started in Super Nepal means I don't know that we're going to see um, too many changes to team lists um, for next year. So I don't think that, that answers your question at all, but I think it's um, it's quite confusing and, and w there's no real clear picture at the end of the day at this point in time. Mm. And as someone who works, you know, who, who as someone who works in netball and who looks into it deeply, from your point of view, how do you see it looking? Negative, positive? Do you mean moving forward for the sport yeah. in general? Yeah. Um, well, I think Netball Australia's got on the front foot of that and are doing their state of play review. And I think that's probably something that I would encourage um associations and clubs around the world to do um, if not governing bodies to really get an insight into how the sport is going to look post-COVID. Um, same with the INF I think it's got to be top down and, and down up really. I don't think that um, I, I, it's that's a, a really difficult question in, in the sense that given that we don't know what investment in sport is going to look like commercially after this year, given that businesses are going to tighten their purse strings and sports are going to have to potentially look quite different for the next couple of years whilst um, we sort of play catch up on the back of COVID. Um, I hope that there's still going to be those people who want to invest in netball and want to play netball and want to work in netball that will still hang around and they're not... Um, I guess, swayed by, by any negativity that comes out of the pandemic. But, um, yeah, the, the future for me in netball looks always looks bright, as does a lot of sports that have a really passionate grassroots base because we know that um, sport is the backbone of communities and we know that grassroots um, sport is the backbone of the elite product. So that sort of sector in the world is, isn't something that I would am too concerned about. 
that, that is that's positive that sounds positive <laughs> um i feel like we've interrogated you quite a bit and it's really interesting actually hearing you talk about it um so if i'll i'll throw it over to uh, sarah and mags if i'm sure they've got a question or two for you but something nice from me now what is your favorite memory michael in netball Ooh. um well i was at the world cup and i was at the com games the last two years and they weren't good memories. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Singapore in 2011, that was my first World Cup that I went to. So that's probably a, um, a pretty big memory that sticks out in, in my mind from a fan perspective. Um, but just, just playing is probably a, a huge memory of mine. I haven't played for about seven years and I, I fear having to do the work to get back and out on court at the end of the day. Um, when I finished playing, I got involved in um, Netball Scoop and then with the Australian Men's and Mixed Executive and, and now Channel 9. So um, my attention sort of shifted away from the court, but I still wanted to be involved with the sport. So... Um, I've got a lot of happy memories and I think the reason why I'm still here is because the sport's brought me so much joy and I feel like I'm contributing. So, um, you know, fingers crossed it continues for a little while longer. Fingers crossed indeed. That's lovely to hear as well. It's lovely to hear, like I say, you talk so passionately about the sport that you love. Um, Max, Sarah, do you have any questions for Michael before we let him go to bed? Well, I'm just going to jump straight in there and talk about the, the big job in Australia. Um, you're exceptionally knowledgeable about netball, Michael, and which is Fabulous. So let's talk about the big job, the uh, diamonds. You know, for you, what are your thoughts? Who's the front runner? Um, I think Simone McInnes. And for me, it's not a matter of just her work in Super Netball. It's the fact that she's the last Australian coach to have won a World Youth Cup title back in 2009. The fact that she was a head coach at the AIS. She's coached in uh, Singapore and Tanzania. She was an assistant to Julie Hornwig. Um, at the Vixens in the ANZ Championship before she took over the head coach role. Um, and she's brought through a lot of young athletes through the pathway in Victoria to build the Vixens that we see now. Um, and I don't know that any other um, applicant has got the resume that she has. I think adding a Super Netball title this year for the Vixens, being a, a Victorian, that would be great as a fan. Um, but I think that would also add to a resume as well. But I'm actually really intrigued as to who she um, potentially presents as her assistant coaches and national selectors, because I think there's going to be, you know, a clean slate on that front as well. And I do wonder if that's taken into consideration by the Netball Australia board as well, or whether that actually comes into it at all, or, um, you know, they appoint the coach and then they're left to their own um, devices on that front. So for me, it's about um, a complete package um, in terms of the Diamonds coach instead of instead of just one person being able to, to take on that load. Mm, thank you, Michael. Mm. I feel like you got a very thorough answer there, Max, didn't you? Oh, complete. <laughs> uh, Sarah, do you have a question for Michael? Um, yeah, I think I'm just always intrigued because, you know, being a stato, you always have like the inside scoop on players. <laughs> Who do you think is, like from a statistics point of view, the most underrated player in Suncorp? Ooh, I don't know that I have analysed players to that extent. I think the, I think the, the person for me is Maddie McCall from Sunshine Coast Lightning. I think to have played in three premier or, or three grand finals and to gather two premierships, you know, one not alongside Laura Langman as well, and to have picked up her workload um, in that 2018 season, I think is pretty phenomenal. Um, she goes about her work. She can call the influence of her wing attack without being um, overly spectacular I guess she sort of lets Laura Langman run in her shoes on that front as well um so Maddie McCauley for mine is is probably the most underrated player in Super Netball Ooh. you look like you agreed with that Sarah the moment you yeah said. <laughs> yeah definitely well Michael uh Sato Hutchinson in <laughs> thank you thank you so much for joining us on Netball Nation it's been genuinely fascinating to get your insight and input so thank you so much for joining us especially this time of night Oh, look, no worries. Happy to stay up late. I've probably got a couple of hours worth of stats review to do now on the back of the two games tonight. We do not envy you. Thank you so much, Michael. Stay safe no and keep up the good work. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Take Michael. it easy. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.
If you missed us talking about it in last week's show, you might not have heard about us partnering up with a great sports app called Heya. Now, Heya is a sports team app for your phone that helps your team grow while bringing everyone together in a shared love for sports. You can use the app to easily organize and communicate with everyone on your team. And guess what? It's free to use and trusted by over 750,000 coaches, parents, and players worldwide. There is so much this app can do, from keeping all your team contact details stored safely, to scheduling games and training, getting player availability, messaging everyone, and more. You can even set your teammates challenges, which is something we all need to keep us entertained and competitive. Now, if you want to check out the app, it's completely free. Just download Hey Art, spelled H-E-J-A, from your app store, and let us know what you think. Now, this has been a weird year for sport, with netball being impacted especially hard by the worldwide pandemic. A BBC sports study released this week found that one in five female athletes may have to give up their sport altogether. The Super League barely got going and grassroots netball ground to a halt for months, but the sport is coming back to life. So how badly has netball been affected, Sarah? And do you think that some players will even be forced to quit as a result of this? I mean, it, it, it has been affected badly. And I think most of my knowledge is obviously at the top end at Super League level um, and seeing the impact it's had on, on Super League franchises. It's, it's a big impact and that's just not your top team. That's your pathway. You know, at the minute, we don't know when pathway is going to come back. Um, we don't know when we can get trials in. We, we don't know when lots of things are going to happen. Um, so it has, been, it has been impacted. And I think for, for some players who aren't in the England programme and are Super League players, um, this will kind of make them think, you know, actually, is, is it a risky business to rely on some of my income to come from netball? And so it might be that some, some players kind of put more of their eggs in the, in the work basket than, than netball. And you can understand that, you know, if, if it's going to be under threat again this year um, from a second wave, then, then netball would, would really, really struggle. But I think the, the good thing about netball is that the grassroots is, is always strong and people are always enthusiastic and want to get back. And you look at clubs coming back now, um, girls getting back into sessions and boys and just getting outside, enjoying the netball again. And I think that's what gives the sport hope. The fact that there's always going to be so many people that want to play it, that um, it, will, it will survive in some, in some form. Yeah, we certainly hope so. And Mags, there's been plenty of talk about how men's sports seems to have taken priority when it comes to coming back post-lockdown. Uh, and of course, on average, they earn far more. So with women's sport, it, it seems as if it's suffered as a result of that. What do you make of that? Well, I don't suppose there's any surprises that the, uh, our male counterparts managed to get back onto their courts and onto their pitches before their female counterparts. Because for as much as we're doing really, really well as female athletes, it's just not equitable at all. Mm. And I just thought, you know, how, how visionary would it have been for female sport to have been allowed to come back first before the male sport to show that kind of support? If you look at the ANZ League, you know, when that was the only netball being played, that they, it, it attracted so many people watching and probably hundreds of thousands of, of new people to netball because that was the only thing being played for females. So I think the people or the powers that be have missed a trick there. They could have put uh, female sport in the high light instead of it always being our male counterparts. But the reality is, is that, you know, money talks and commercially, that's what it was all about, you know, getting these big leagues finished, which are all men, and no surprises. No, I think you're absolutely right, Mags. And, you know, I know it isn't either of your roles to sort of look at a plan and lay out a plan that netball can do to build that momentum. But, Sarah, you know, there was such a boom, you know, after the Commonwealth Games and gold medal in 2018. Pandemic aside, okay, in, so we fast forward and the pandemic is over or there's a vaccine found and we are over it. Can you see how netball can, can recreate that boom as a sport? Yeah, because I think people are crying out for, for sport and for entertainment and for things to get back to normal. And I think when they do, people will be more inclined to appreciate what they've got. So when you've got Super League teams or international teams playing on your doorstep, go and watch them. And I think people will do because 
for us female sport that the benefit you have got is that it's affordable you know compared to a lot of male sport it's affordable players are accessible it's a family day out and I think that's that's the key to it you know you've got to get people watching the game again yes we want it on sky and yes we want crowds back because the more eyeballs we get on the game the more people realize how great it is the bigger it grows and so it's hard from an England perspective because they will have a set calendar from now until Commonwealth Games and I think the good thing is that Commonwealth Games is in Birmingham so it's in England. It is on people's doorstep. It will be in people's face. It'll be all over TV. And I think that will be another push. And England will want to do well in that because of that reason. Um, but I think below that, we, we've got to get fans back watching the sport for, for the long-term sustainability of it. And unfortunately, as we always say when we start talking about this and digging a bit, it ultimately comes down to money, doesn't it? It comes down to a lack of investment within the sport. So I'll, I'll open this up to both of you, but Mags, you first. How do you see netball attracting more sponsors and being able to not just recover financially, but get more money in the sport? How, where do you start with that? Right. I mean... <laughs> We've already talked, haven't we, previously and probably today when we spoke to Michael about, um, you know, maybe a different formula with the sport, making it a little bit more exciting and interesting. Uh, for me, when you get the close games under normal game rules, I don't think it gets any more exciting than that. But, you know, maybe mixing up the formula seems to be what the governing bodies seem to want to do, even if it's opposed by the players and the officials. Um, but again, we're talking, it's that um, commercial element it's about pounds and pence and sadly you know we can't get away from it and you just kind of think to yourself somebody out there within the commercial environment has to be brave we've got vitality that have you know supported our roses program and the fact that on the back of the commonwealth games nike stepped up and they got involved i mean that's just huge to get somebody like nike involved with our you know national team but it needs somebody out there to invest and invest not just for a year and let's see what happens at the end of that 12 month cycle. We need somebody that's prepared to say, I'm going to invest in you for the next four to possibly eight years. And we'll, you know, we'll ride the highs with the lows because that's what always happens when, you know, these things are building. And, and we're talking somebody big, like for instance, like L'Oreal. You see all these footballers that are doing all the stuff with L'Oreal and, you know, and what, blah, blah, because I'm worth it. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, the people that spend the majority of money on L'Oreal products are women. So why can't somebody like that step across to, you know, a huge sport like ours, which, you know, we saw participation rise, was it about 130,000 after the Commonwealth Games? pick one of our fabulous superstars that are out there at the moment because within the netball world all of the roses are high profile individuals use a couple of those girls to promote the l'oreal products but then link in to not just the roses but you know like the you know i think they should be buying into super leagues as well and pathways you know just to keep everything moving through um and that's where we're going to generate some money and keep us sustainable max is short of some shampoo <laughs> yeah. you should say that but last time we said this Deb sent us some trainers <laughs> <laughs> so every time every time you go in the cupboard if you're missing something you're just going to give him a shout out <laughs> yeah. but it's true Sarah joking has had you know how much money do women spend on things like that or you know other products you know I don't know Dove think of anything that's big on the television with advertising mm -hmm. that women use because women spend more money on these things than men mm -hmm. so why aren't we tapping into people like that yeah, absolutely right. And, and I'm going to, I don't know if you two know about th this stat that I'm going to show. Oh, check me out with my stat. Oh, um, I don't know if you know this stat, but if you're listening, um, you may or may not have heard it. 80% of female athletes earn less than £30,000 and 60% earn less than 10000 and have to hold down a regular job, right? Now, you might be aware of that because obviously you're, you, you're directly involved with the netball world. How does that change? I know we need sponsors. I know that, that, that the revenue has to come from that. But how does it change so that your players feel valued? Do you know what I think? Um, sorry, I, I, this, isn't, this isn't a new problem. No. Like, when I started playing Super League, no one got paid. Like, no one. So that's, 
I mean, that's a long time ago now, but that's say 15 years ago. So in 15 years, we've come, we've come a distance that now there's a minimum, a minimum payment you can give to players and we've got a salary cap and it's not, it's not a new problem and it's not going to be fixed overnight. But like Max was saying, it's got to be a long-term investment from people with, with what's happened with COVID. I think sport has, has been woken up to how fragile it is at the minute that sports teams exist year to year. And in, in bigger sports like, like football, they rely on TV money. Netball relies mostly on crowds and merchandise sales and, and things like that. And so there's got to be a number of areas that improve. One is we need more people to watch. We need to be better at marketing ourselves and selling merchandise and getting on, on that bandwagon we need it on TV more and we need the TV to pay us more money for having it on TV, which means the only reason they're going to do that is if people, more people watch it on TV. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a vicious like a chicken cycle. And egg, isn't it? Yeah. Like, so there's lots of areas that can improve and I think they slowly are doing what we need is for that progression to be quicker. Um, and, and that kind of feeds into what you were saying earlier, Mags, about how it would have been a great opportunity for netball and women's sport had they been sh- given them the rights, you know, to put them on TV and have people. It would have opened up the audience during this pandemic had they Absolutely. been given the opportunity to do that. And Absolutely. then, like Sarah said, the more people are watching, the more interest there is from advertisers, from sponsorship, and the revenue comes in. It just seems it's such a shame that it you know, this conversation, you're absolutely right, Sarah, it's not a new problem and it's certainly not the first time we've discussed it on here. Um, and it is, you know, you say it's changed in 10 to 15 years. Well, is it really good enough if we look in another 10 to 15 years and the same amount has been, of change has been made again? That's a long time. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about streaming, you know, can you stream games and can you get people to watch it? And I think it's at this point, as a as a sport you've got to look outside the box a little bit you know what we're doing is okay but is it getting us to where we want to be not really so you need to do something else you need to do something different you need to think outside the box and like i said commonwealth games is a massive opportunity it'll be on bbc it'll be on people's television 24 7 people if england do well it'll be massive and it's in birmingham but you can't just wait for big tournaments to come around because they come around a Commonwealth Games is once in four years. So you can't wait for that and then jump on it for a year and then it disappears again. It, it needs to be a constant push. There's almost a, an argument for um, doing like the fo- ladies footballers have done, like the female tennis players have done. Um, you know, they've almost thrown down the rackets and put down the boots and said, we need recognition and we need to we need people to know that we are as worthy as our male counterparts and we deserve because we are um, equally able, you know, we're playing at the top of our game. Why are we not commanding the same sort of coverage? I think netball's in a unique position because one of its selling points is that it's a female sport. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really have a male equivalent in terms of a top league um, to the super league. So that's a huge selling point for it. But on the downside of that, what football and, and tennis and, and other sports have been able to do is have a direct comparison and go, do you know what, if we're going to talk about equality, why is the prize money for Wimbledon not the same? Then it is the same. Do you know, like if, if we're going to talk about equality, why do these footballers get these facilities and we don't get them? But netball's not got that. You can't go, why don't we get what someone else gets? It's, you've, got to, you've got to fight it yourself. And so I think that's part of the reason that it's been slower. And it's partly because it's a female sport and we're all so damn polite that we don't <laughs> just go, yeah. do you know what? Our sport's better than that. Like, who we champions want, we want it, more. Sarah? Who champions it? Because is there a blockage somewhere at the top that's not allowing it? I mean, we won't even start talking about salary caps. But, you know, I mean, that in itself is a pittance. You know, because there's somebody like you as a head coach, having to manage on that salary cap that you've got. You know, the amazing things you could do, Sarah, if they gave you a couple of pounds more, you know, and I'll leave it at that. And uh, I take on your point about the fact that we don't have, you know, a a male equivalent at the same level. 
Um, but we still do have um, athletes that train damn hard, you know, four yeah, or five yeah, times a we week. Do. And let's, and let's be real about it. Like, football and tennis, it wasn't easy. They, they, you know, hammered the door down and they had to make a big stink about it, even though they had all that money in the male game. Yeah. So it, it, I'm not saying they've had an easy ride by, by any sense of it. I'm just saying that, you know, as a sport, we need to, we need to demand more. Yeah. And I think this is one of the uh, overriding things that really need to be covered because like you said there, Mags, on an individual basis and as a whole, netball could do so much more if it only had the investment. So it's the kind of thing that we're right to even be talking about it on this show. We just need more of this. We need more voices and more people. Can I ask you both a question before we move on? Do you think if netball was a predominantly male sport, do you think they would be getting paid? what netball get pay, gets paid Ooh. or do you I think they would have fox in the hen house now well, do you, or do you think they would have said no we're not going to stand for this a long time ago probably it, I, I'm, I'm torn on this one because part of me thinks you know that there's also sports out there in this country and, and elsewhere where males play and they don't get paid great you look at like the top hockey league and even the top basketball league in this country, you're not, most players aren't getting life changing money. But the other part of me thinks, you know what men, they don't stand for it. And men go into decision making decision makers offices and there are other men. And it is like a little bit of a, like, let's sit down and have a beer and discuss a million pound contract that doesn't happen in the female sport world. So mm-hmm. I'd, I'd like to think that they would get paid the same as, as what, what's happening at the minute, because a lot of people have worked very hard to get to this point in netball. But the other part of me just thinks they wouldn't because they'd have either stopped playing or they'd have hammered some doors down. I mean, I know uh, some of our, some of our top, top netballers now have uh, agents. You know, that was just unheard of. In, in my day, because of the fact that netball was always under the radar. Yeah, it was played internationally, but, you know, it was just a, a group of women, you know, running around in the lycra. But the fact that these girls now are starting to recognise their value and their worth, which is probably another headache for head coaches when it comes to dealing with, <laughs> dealing with them. But the fact that they've got agents is, is an indication that they are now beginning to recognise their worth. And these agents are going into battle for them. You know, still a small amount of money that's, that's out there, but they are fighting for them. So probably moving in the right direction, um, but very slowly. Absolutely. I think we're all agreed. Heading in the right direction, but needs to be much faster. As always, you can get in touch and have your opinion and your say on that or anything else. If there's anything you'd like us to talk, to talk about, Netball Nation on the socials and hello at mynetballnation.com on the email. Now then, it's time to put our full focus on the A N Z. Uh, we're just getting to crunch time for the teams at the top. The tactics that have been missed its game was one to watch as the winner would almost certainly book a spot in the grand final against Pulse, who also suffered another loss. So, how did round nine go? As it stands, guys, it's 13-10 to Sarah from the last set of predictions, right? So let's have a little look at this, shall we? I had an absolute stinker this week. You did. Take oh, but in fairness, to you, in fairness to you, Sarah, two of the games went to just one. I know. Goal. I know. just can't catch a break. You did, but she still lost. Just so <laughs> let's <laughs> go. Oh, you're <laughs> harsh, Emma. <laughs> so still be Mystics. Mags, you went for Mystics. Sarah, you went for Mystics. Neither of you got a point. It was still 51-47 to Mystics. Right, and then we got Steel versus Pulse. Uh, you both went for Pulse, both got it right as well, 34-49, well done. Max, uh, for Mystics v Tactics, you went for Tactics, sorry, you went for Mystics, and like you say, it was 42-43, so Max, Tactics just edged that one, you get the point there. Magic v Stars, Max, you went for Stars, sorry, you went for Magic, and uh, yeah, once again, just mm-hmm. edged it, like you say, 46 stars, 45 magic, and pulse the tactics. Uh, you both went for pulse there, and shock horror tactics. It was 32 39. Um, now that was a bit of a shock, was it not? Well, <laughs> a sh- 
they, they talk every week about the, the, the depth in the pulse bench and you see as the girls get introduced, you know, for that maybe five, ten minutes worth of game or out they come again, you know, a little bit of impact and off they go. But it looked as though they missed Gordon and they missed Echinacea. They just did not have the flow in their game at all, uh, Pulse. In fact, it was almost a bit cringy to watch in, in places. It was a shocking game, wasn't yeah. it? Was an ugly game. It was not um, good for them. No, it wasn't. And I mean, to be fair to Pulse, if you're going to miss the majority of your attacking end, you're probably going to struggle. But they looked tired. They looked flat. It just, it, it was an ugly game. And, you know, tactics, what a weekend for tactics. They beat Mystics, yeah. which basically puts them in the driving seat to get a grand final place. And next day they back it up by beating Pulse and, and booking a spot in the grand final. So Huge weekend for tactics. Mm. I'm disappointed in Mystics because I thought this was going to be the year that they didn't crumble and at the very last they kind of have. Um, the game against tactics was a great game. Like they, they lost that by one and, and, mm. and did really well. But you can't, you can't lose to Steel at that point in the season when, when it's so tight. And they'll be really disappointed with that. Curveball then. Can tactics take the title then after a tough few seasons? Well, I don't know where I saw it, but right at the beginning of all this, way back when, before this whole competition started, I'd read somewhere that somebody had picked tactics for, for taking the title this season. Really? Have they just now managed to get the groove on and have it coming together just right? We'll see. We'll see. Because, again, with Echinacea and Gordon back in that front line, it'd be a completely different game. We shall see yeah. indeed. But for now, we shall predict... Because, <laughs> Max, you are closing that gap. I think there's like one point between you now. And Sarah, you got off to an absolute flyer. So we need you to just not have them there in this one. Oh, so, terrible. are we ready? Not really. That's the bait. <laughs> it's not optional. Mystics v. Stars. Max? I'm going Mystics. Go Mystics. Sarah? Yeah, I'm going Mystics. Both agreeing Mystics on that one. Uh, Mystics v. Magic. Uh, Magic have been pushing teams, um, the team that promises but hasn't delivered. So I have to go uh, Mystics again. What about you, Sarah? I'm actually going to go Magic because I've stuck with Mystics and then I'm just, I am just just feel burnt by them after this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm <laughs> going Magic. You know, okay. no loyalty here. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah is going Magic. Still be Tactics, Max. Tactics. Yeah, I think... Um, they're just on a roll now. And uh, yeah, I think it's them. They'll pull it off. Okay, okay, Sarah, do you agree? <gasps> oh, she's got that grimace on her face. Yeah, phone. she's thinking. Oh, I know. It'll be tight. I don't, if, I don't know if tactics might start giving people a bit of a rest or, you know, just not going quite as hard because, you know, they've made the final. So I think it, I think it might be tight. Where, is, it, is it at steel? I think, if, I think if it's a steel, I'm going to go steel. You're going steel? Yeah, and I think it is. So I'm going that makes it more fun anyway, right. you do. So you're going steel. Uh, now, pulls at these stars, Max. <sighs> we said, didn't we, that after they'd had their, their other loss, mm. pulls, that they'd come back strong. And they did in the first game of the doubleheader this week. Um, and I hate to go against my girl, Maya, um, but I'm going to I'm gonna have to go with pulls. You're going pulls. On, like the, hope, gonna on go the hope that they've got them, you know, Echinacio and uh, Gordon. Yeah. I'm going to go Pulse because I, I reckon, again, they'll have got a rocket. They'll have had a bit of time off. off yeah. They'll then be in training hard. And I think if you get even one of those two players back, I think you'll be fine. And finally, Pulse v Magic. Um, on previous games, Pulse have absolutely blown the games out against Magic. So, And even though Magic are doing better, still Pulse. Yeah. Yeah, You're I both agree. Going pulse. pulse. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we shall uh, revisit that and see if you manage to close the gap any further, shall we, Max? We'll see. <laughs> right then, before we say goodbye, we've had a really good question come through from listener Faith Florence about the ANZ. Uh, she says, good to have you back. Thank you very much. Good to have you with us. I was struck by a couple of interesting umpiring calls that were new to me in the tactics matches last week. In game one, Jane Watson was told, don't stare at her while standing beside the player after a penalty. <laughs> In game two, Foka Hockertow got cautioned for stamping her foot as the shooter was shooting, which I'm sure I've seen her do before without a call. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on intimidation rules in general. Sometimes it makes sense, but sometimes seems a strange call to me. I love the don't stare at her thing. It's so... 
<laughs> so creepy, isn't it? Someone's just stood next to you, just like staring I'm at you. Eyeballing you, <laughs> side eyeing you. Like, don't miss, don't miss. <laughs> Watching. Um, I find intimidation real stupid because the whole point of a defender is to put a shoot. Put them off. To try and make them miss. What I, on, the, on the reverse of that, I kind of understand those calls because if the rule's there and, and you're not allowed to intimidate, then don't kind of make it so obvious that you're not trying to get the ball. You know, if you just stood there staring at someone like a creep, then <laughs> you're, not, you're in no way going to be able to get the ball. And likewise, <laughs> the, the foot stamp is just like it's not a, a natural takeoff position. It's just stamping your foot to kind of put, trying to put someone off. You know, like I said, defenders generally are there to intimidate and, and put people off. And most of the time when defenders jump, it's not, it's not with a genuine intent to get the ball. No. Um, but it at least looks like it is, whereas mm. I think those are just a bit, a bit obvious. I like what, them. <laughs> what did they say it is? Um, intentional behaviour, I think it's, it's classed as. Intentional behaviour that's... Because the rest that, of it's you, just done by accident. Exactly. <laughs> intentional behaviour with the aim to intimidate or put them off. I mean... Could you imagine? I've got the rule, rule books in your head. I, yeah, you know it's one A. And can, I, I wouldn't be able to do a Gary Burgess on you. But <laughs> having been a defender, I've had, it, I've had plenty of uh, intimidation calls. Um, I just, oh, I've got an Italian word for you, Sarah. Principessas, which is pretty clear. Yeah, principessas are what we call our shooters. Princesses. They're like your firstborn child that you wrap up in cotton wool to make sure nothing damages them. And then everybody else on court from wing attack back to defenders are your second born child that you'd let juggle knives. <laughs> uh, but, but they're there to do a very, very vital job and you need them to be able to put that ball through the ring. Um, they're a valuable asset on the court. And yeah, defenders will do whatever they want to do. I think the staring at her is a little bit much, but I get the fokakata with the stamping of the foot, you know, the grabbing of the skirt, maybe the little elbow on the non uh, ball side of it, so the umpire can't see. You do what you've got to do, as shooters do what they've got to do to try and stop the defenders stopping them doing what they're doing. Yeah. Absolutely do. There you go, Faith. There is the answer to your question. And as always, just like Faith has, if there's anything you want us to cover in future episodes, get in touch via social media or email us hello at mynetballnation.com. Now then, that's it for another show. As always, if there's anything you want us to cover in no, that's just the same thing again. Uh, right then, guys, before we wrap up, any shout outs? I've got some. Woo! Finally, she's been on holiday. She's come back a new woman. Go I on. know. It's, like, it's almost like I planned. <laughs> um, well, first of all, shout out to the, the Super League teams who are kind of trying to get stuff out there now for, for the community and for the fans. And, you know, I know Thunder launched their membership um, last week. Um, at Lightning, we've got some sessions running. I've seen Bath and Pulse and different people have put trials out there. So well done to the Super League teams for kind of getting the house in order and, and adapting to COVID, number one. Yes. And number two, shout out to Dan Wooten, who um, does talk radio drive time and was telling me on Instagram that he listens to our podcast. Oh, let's hear it for Dan. Yeah. So, thank you, Dan. He was listening when he was in Santorini. So um, good on him. Oh, hard life, isn't it? <laughs> him in Santorini, you in Italy. You must be <laughs> we were just discussing holidays, you know, where it's good to go. Oh, and yeah, Emma, God's country. Just thank God's bounty. Mags, have you got any shout outs? Oh, cripes. I suppose it's to all, all the uh, summer camps that are taking place at the moment at the, um, you know, the community participation level. School holidays. I know that most uh, girls who play netball through school or through the clubs look forward to camps. So anybody up and down the country that's putting out uh, summer camps for um, our young athletes to participate in and to break up the monotony of the summer school break, uh, enjoy, and uh, hopefully the weather won't be too bad to them because they're all outside. Oh, yeah, good luck with that. I mean, it's a bit of a gamble, isn't it? But best mm. of luck and enjoy it all. Uh, and thank you, guys, as always. Thank you very much for listening to Netball Nation. Don't forget, we're giving you the chance to win a pair of ASIC's brand new netball trainers for you and a pair for a mate. With eight pairs to give away of four shoes available now at Netball UK. To enter, go to our website and click on the banner on the homepage and you'll be back to court ready with Netball UK and ASIC's. Thanks, guys. See you next week. See ya. Bye. Bye. This is Netball Nation.